Good morning and welcome. It's good to see each and every one of you in this morning. I trust that you are prepared to worship the Lord in spirit and truth and allow him to have his way in this service this morning. We have an order that we follow, but as I have told my church many, many times, God is always in control. And our plans are subject to his plans. We want him to have his way in this service this morning and to receive all the glory, honor, and praise. I'm going to ask you to stand if you're able for opening prayer. Let us bow, Father in heaven, as we come before your throne of grace this morning. We ask you to come and to meet with us in this service. You know, Father in heaven, the plans that we have this morning. But, Father, we want you to come and to meet with us. We want you to have your way. We want, Father in heaven, all that is said and done this morning to lift up your holy name and to give you glory and honor and praise. We pray, Father in heaven, that you would be with us throughout this day today. May our hearts and minds be centered and focused upon you to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. For it's in your precious holy name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. There was a lawyer once. His name was Francis Scott Key. He penned a song that I'm sure you're aware of. You've seen it. It's in most hymnals throughout our churches. It's called the National Anthem. It is our song as an American. We go, however, to a ball game, we stand in our church services, and we sing the words of that song, and they float over our minds and our lips, and we don't even realize what we're singing. Most of us have memorized it as a child, but we've never really thought about what it means. Let me tell you a story. Francis Scott Key was a lawyer in Baltimore. The colonies were engaged in vicious conflict with the mother country, Britain. Because of this conflict and the protractedness of it, they had accumulated prisoners on both sides. The American colonies had prisoners and the British had prisoners. And the American government initiated a move. They went to the British and they said, let us negotiate for the release of these prisoners. They said, we want to send a man out to discuss this with you. They were holding the American prisoners in boats about a thousand yards offshore. And they said, we want to send a man by the name of Francis Scott Key. He will come out and negotiate to see if we can make a mutual exchange. On the appointed day in a rowboat, he went out to this boat and he negotiated with the British officials. And they reached a conclusion that men could be exchanged on a one-for-one -one basis. Francis Scott Key, jubilant with the fact that he'd been successful, went down below in the boats and what he found was a cargo hold full of humanity, men. And he said, men, I've got news for you tonight, you're free. He said, tonight I have negotiated successfully your return to the colonies. He said, you'll be taken out of this boat, out of this filth, out of your chains. As he went back up on board to arrange for their passage to the shore, the admiral came and he said, we have a slight problem. He said, we will still honor our commitment to release these men, but it'll be merely academic after tonight. It won't matter. And Francis Scott Key said, what do you mean? He said, well, Mr. Key, he said, tonight we have laid an ultimatum upon the colonies. Your people will either capitulate and lay down the colors of that flag that you think so much of, or you see that fort right over there, Fort Henry? He said, we're going to remove it from the face of the earth. He said, how are you going to do that? He said, if you will, scan the horizon of the sea. And as he looked, he could see hundreds of little dots. And he said, that's the entire British war fleet. He said, all of the gunpowder, all of the armament is being called upon to demolish that fort. It will be here within striking distance in a matter of about two and a half hours. He said, the war is over. These men would be free anyway. He said, you can't shell that fort. He said, that's, that's a large fort. He said, it's full of women and children. He says, it's predominantly not a military fort. They said, don't worry about it. They said, we've left them a way out. And he said, what's that? He said, do you see that flag way up on the rampart? He said, we have told them that if they will lower that flag, the shelling will stop immediately. And we'll know that they've surrendered and you'll now be under British rule. Francis Scott Key went down below and told the men what was about to happen. And they said, how many ships? He said, hundreds. 
The ships got closer. Francis Scott Key went back up on top and he said, Men, I'll shout down to you what's going on as we watch. As twilight began to fall, and as the haze hung over the ocean as it does at sunset, suddenly the British war fleet unleashed. <clears throat> he says the sound was deafening. There were so many guns that there were no reliefs. He said it was absolutely impossible to talk or hear. He said suddenly the sky, although dark, was suddenly lit. And he says from down below, all he could hear the men, the prisoners, saying was, Tell us where the flag is. What have they done with the flag? Is the flag still flying over the rampart? Tell us. One hour, two hours, three hours into the shelling. Every time the bomb would explode and it would be close to the flag, they could see the flag in the illuminated red glare of that bomb. And Francis Scott Key would report down to the men below, it's still up. It's not down. The admiral came and he said, your people are insane. He said, what's the matter with them? He said, don't they understand this is an impossible situation? Francis Scott Key said he remembered what George Washington had said. He said the thing that sets the American Christian apart from all other people in the world is he will die on his feet before he'll live on his knees. The Admiral said we have now instructed all of the guns to focus on the rampart to take that flag down. He said we don't understand something. Our reconnaissance tells us that that flag has been hit directly again and again and again, and yet it's still flying. We don't understand that. But he said, now we're about to bring every gun for the next three hours to bear on that point. Francis Scott Key said the barrage was unmerciful. All that he could hear was the men down below praying. The prayer. God keep that flag flying where we last saw it. Sunrise came. He said there was a heavy mist hanging over the land, but the rampart was tall enough. There stood the flag, completely nondescript, in shreds. The flagpole itself was at a crazy angle. The flag was still at the top. Francis Scott Key went aboard and immediately went into Fort Henry to see what had happened. And what he found had happened was that that flagpole and that flag had suffered repetitious direct hits. And when hit had fallen. But men, fathers, who knew what it meant for that flag to be on the ground. Although knowing that all of the British guns were trained on it, walked over and held it up humanly until they died. Their bodies were removed and others took their place. Francis Scott Key said what held that flagpole in place at that unusual angle were patriots' bodies. He penned the song, O oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming. Or the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that the flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet fly and wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the brave? The debt was demanded. The price, it was paid.
United States of America, and, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Song number 30 in your hymnal. Thank the Lord. You may be seated. We're going to sing a song now that's called God of Our Ages. You'll find the words on the wall here this morning.
singing this morning. Let's all stand for prayer. Our gracious Father, we come to thee today thinking of this wonderful land that we have had the privilege to live in for many years. And we have seen other countries, Lord, that have not the freedoms that we enjoy. And our hearts have been very saddened by the fact that you have not been honored in many places in the world. And we come to especially thank thee today, Lord, for all the freedoms that are afforded us because of our forefathers who gave their all financially and eventually some of them their lives for this freedom. We thank thee first of all, Lord, for the freedom of religion. And sometimes when we look around about us and we see devil worship and all of these things, we say in our heart, you know, that ought not to be. But if we can stop that, we can stop what we have today. And we have enjoyed this, Lord, all of our lives. From the time we were three weeks old, we've enjoyed this. This ability to come to thee and to worship thee. And we thank thee for that and we pray that it will never be taken from us. And may we do our part, Lord through prayer and through supporting those who have rule over us and going to the polls and voting, Lord, may we never see this taken away. And we think of, Lord, the freedom of speech that we have. And we thought just recently, Lord, at the Olympics, how thousands and thousands of booklets were passed out that declare thy glory and thy holiness and declare to people that they can be taken from the bondage of sin and have freedom in Christ Jesus. And we thank thee, Lord, for this freedom of speech, and may it ever be with us. And this freedom of the press that allows us, Lord, to speak and to say those things that we want. And Lord, we thank thee for the privilege we have to assemble here together today. And we did not have to sneak in and we're not worried about the authorities coming and, and taking us out. But, Lord, it has happened in other countries where the law has come in and shot people for worshiping thee. And we pray, Lord, that that will never, that will never come to our country. But, Lord, if it does, we're thankful that we have an assurance that we can stand for thee regardless of what it takes. And just as those men stood for the flag and held it up, Lord, we can stand for thee and for righteousness and for the Bible, even if it takes our life. We thank thee, Lord, for this freedom of assembly, and we pray that it will ever be. And Lord, we thank thee for the, the right we have to petition and the civil courts uh, that we have, Lord, and, and we pray today, Lord, for every judge from the lowest court all the way to the Supreme Court that they will be reminded uh, in this time of year, Lord, that a price has been paid for the freedom that we have. And we thank Thee, Lord, for the right to bear arms and to protect our families and to protect ourselves and we thank thee, Lord, for equal justice that we have enjoyed that much of the world knows nothing about. And we thank thee, Lord, for the, the right to own property and, and uh, to have our homes. All of these things, Lord, they are gifts from thee and gifts from those who uh, in their hearts had a vision to sell everything they had and to get on a ship and to seek for a place where they could have these freedoms. And we thank thee today for those. And Lord, the requests have been brought in today on a 
the local scene here that Lord has Brother Peters has been being taken to uh, the hospital. We pray, Lord, that thou will just be with him. And uh, will thou help them, Lord, he and his wife, as, as they go. And, Lord, uh, anxious hearts are always a part of that, that situation. And we've been there, Lord, and that's the time when we need thy girding arm. And that's the time when we've had it, Lord. And we pray that you would just help uh, both brother and sister Peters, Lord, to feel that great arm uh, to go around them, Lord, and to uh, say, you're my child, and I, I know where you are. We pray, Lord, that you would also remember Sister Rauschenberger today who needs a gracious touch of thee. And, Lord, we're glad that your word still says that you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above all with that we can ask or thank, Lord. And we, we revel, Lord, today in that power and in that glory and in the, uh, the faith that we have uh, that you see us as your children. And we pray, Lord, for the remainder of this service uh, that thou would just help us, Lord, uh, as we focus on uh, our freedoms today uh, and our, our country, Lord. May it be more to us when we go out the door than when we came in. We ask it all in thy name. Amen. You may be seated.
to the flag, and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands, one Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again, with life and liberty for all. It's not our sacred honor, our devotion to a cause that preserves this nation's greatness, makes us rise above our flaws. It's not in rights or freedom, justice or liberty, honor, courage, or even might. No, these things are not the key. It's not the dream of wealth or gold, industrial strength or gold. It's not an innovative power or items bought and sold. It's not because of men who came in search of something more, who left home and friend and family to settle on this shore. It's not just because of fallen men, men who stood so tall, those who fought and died unknown, who sacrificed their all. What makes America so great? What makes this nation stand? What makes us rise above the rest in air on sea or land? It's because of God. Because of him, can we ever boast or say this land we love is what it is due alone to grace each day. God's providential hand has proven through famine, war, and strife, through victory, peace, and plenty, through pain and taken life. And deep within the heart of man, we recognize each day we're only great because of him. God bless the USA. skies for amber waves of grain for purple mountains majesty above the fruited plains America America God shed
I can sing like that. <laughs> Only in my dreams. <laughs> uh, have you been enjoying it so far? Yeah. It's been a real delight and honor to have both Brother Castle and Brother Bates and their families with us. Um, my first time ever meeting Brother Castle was today and saw this young guy come walking and I heard so much about playing a trumpet and I looked and he had some ch young children with him and I thought, wow, okay. And then I met his lovely wife and they have a, has a beautiful, beautiful family. And of course, it's been a delight to be with the Bates. I know Brother Donnie Bates for a long time. Uh, he attended GBS and um, I think we were there maybe overlapped just a little bit um, but remember seeing him there at the school many times coming up for camp meeting and revivals and things of that nature. And it's a delight to have him here with us this morning. You could say that Brother Bates' life could be summed up in one word, and that one word would be service. For the past 19 years, he has served his clients as their faithful advisor. For 17 years, he served the people of the Winchester Pilgrim Nazarene Church as their spiritual advisor taking care of families in their time of greatest need and ministering to their spiritual needs. He has served his nation as a voice for conservatism and constitutional fidelity. Brother Bates is a recovering politician. <laughs> Having been in the political rehab for exactly one month today, while it is highly unlikely he will ever be a candidate for public office again, Don will continue to be a voice for freedom and will use his influence to inspire Americans to fight for the liberties granted to us by Almighty God and the Constitution of the United States of America. Brother Bates and his wife Amy have four children, 18-year-old Trey and 15-year-old Blake, and then they have the two 11-month-old twins, Ellie and Ethan. And it's a delight and an honor to have him with us at this time. We're gonna have him come and share what the Lord has laid on his heart for us this morning. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Forsey. It is great to be with you all today, and thank you, Phil Alexander, for the kind invitation for our family to join you for this um, uh, patriotic service. And um, I look out across this crowd, and, and um, it's, it's an honor for me to have some friends and, uh, that, uh, that came today for this event. One came all the way from Jackson County. Albert Eldridge, shout out to you, my friend, for being here. And then I see Dwight and Sue Lyle, my Tea Party friends, made it today as well. I'm so glad you're here. And, um, and I've got family here today. You know, families take a risk to, to come support a family member, you know. It, but I'm so glad my aunt and uncle and, and my cousin and his wife, I'm, I'm glad they're all here. And, of course, you know my sister, Melissa. How could you not know my sister, Melissa? Uh, and her family. I'm glad that they're here. And, and, and it is a joy for us to be here. And I, I can't tell you how much I enjoy getting to sing with Trey and Blake. It's, um, I, I used to say back before Blake's voice went down, Trey's voice went down first. And I said, it's a good thing that one of them's voice went down or we'd have sounded like the chipmunks. <laughs> But it's so much fun to sing with them. And uh, then, of course, um, 11 months ago, next Saturday, Ellie Renee and Ethan John uh, joined our family. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, and some other friends are here today from Marion County. And one of them's holding, um, I believe that's Mr. Ethan back there, um, causing a little bit of a ruckus. We get asked some of the most amazing questions about our babies. I kid you not, we get these questions all the time. When we walk through the mall, um, we normally get stopped four or five times. The, the question we get the most, got it again this morning. Not at the mall, but got it this morning, staying at the, at the motel where we stayed. We were eating breakfast, and a gentleman said, are they twins? And I said, no, the hospital was having a buy one, get one free sale, so we took one of each. So we get that. I kid you not, we get that question all the time. Another one that we've occasionally gotten is, how do you tell them apart? Well, one's a boy and one's a girl. So <laughs> hopefully you can figure that out. Um, I will say this, though. If you've ever tried to change diapers while you're wearing your bifocals, it just doesn't work. <laughs> Take off the bifocals. It is not a good idea. 
But we are extremely blessed. Another comment that I heard this morning that we get all of the time, and it's a comment that, that Amy and I really don't like. Uh, it's this comment, boy, you've got your hands full, don't you? Boy, you've got your hands full. We hear that all the time. And what people don't know is that Amy prayed for twins. Now, I tell her she's got to pray now. We win the lottery so we can pay for them. But, uh, but she did pray that God would bless our home with twins, and God answered that prayer. And so what I've started telling people is, you're right, we have our hands full of blessings because that's exactly the way that we feel about it. Now, I'm not real excited about the fact that by the time the babies are out of the diapers, I'll be going in them. But... Um, <laughs> But it is okay. I've been told that twins will keep us young. And so I, I look forward to that. And I'm honored to be asked to, to share a, a freedom challenge with you today. I am a recovering politician. I have been in political rehab for a month, for one month today. I still have the shakes, but I'm doing better. Um, but two days ago, we celebrated the 238th birthday of our great nation, a nation birthed in freedom. And freedom is and must always be the bedrock of our existence. And yet freedom is under attack. And I hope my speech today will inspire you to fight for freedom. I hope it will. Former domestic terrorist and uh, friend of President Barack Obama, Bill Ayers, recently said on Fox News that America wasn't exceptional. Well, I personally disagree with the terrorist. I believe America is exceptional. We're exceptional because we are the longest running experiment in history as a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And at the heart of this experiment is one theme, freedom. And so this morning... I want to talk to you about freedom. I have four thoughts that if you want to jot them down, you can, but you don't have to. But the first one that I will share with you is the desire for freedom. I believe the Almighty built within each of us a desire to be free. Why do you say that, Don? Well, because he took a personal interest in our desire to be free. If you go all the way back to the book of Exodus, we find the first time in history where people were enslaved. And back in Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, uh, it reads this, And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians." You see, ladies and gentlemen, I believe God has a vested interest in our freedom. And it was that same desire which caused a ragged band of 102 pilgrims to board a ship in 1620 and come to a new world. All for one reason. They wanted to be free. And yet, 156 years later, the long arm of tyranny and taxation reached the new world, causing another band of brave men to sign their names to a declaration that said, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, 
that they are endowed by their creator, capital C, with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I think Bill and Glory Gaither said it as good as it can be said when they wrote these words, even life begins because a baby fights for freedom. I believe naturally built into every one of us is the desire to be free. And yet what history has taught us is that freedom isn't free. And so the next point I want to share with you is, is the determination of freedom. What price have, have some paid for freedom? Have you ever studied what happened to the 56 men who signed the Declaration of Independence? Let me read to you what happened to them. Five signers were captured by the British as traitors and tortured before they died. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Two lost their sons in the Revolutionary Army. Another had two sons captured. Nine of the 56 fought and died from wounds or hardships of the Revolutionary War. They signed and they pledged their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. What kind of men were they? 24 were lawyers and jurists. 11 were merchants. 9 were farmers and large plantation owners. Men of means, well educated. But they signed the Declaration of Independence knowing full well that the penalty would be death if they were captured. Carter Braxton of Virginia, a wealthy planter and trader, saw his ship swept from the seas by the British Navy. He sold his home and properties to pay his debts, and he died in rags. Thomas McKean was so hounded by the British that he was forced to move his family almost constantly. He served in the Congress without pay and his family was kept in hiding. His possessions were taken from him, and poverty was his reward. Vandals or soldiers looted the properties of Dillery, Hall, Clymer, Walton, Gwinnett, Hayward, Rutledge, and Middleton. At the Battle of Yorktown, Thomas Nelson Jr. noted that the British General Cornwallis had taken over the Nelson home for his headquarters. He quietly urged General George Washington to open fire. The home was destroyed and Nelson died bankrupt. Francis Lewis had his home and properties destroyed. The enemy jailed his wife and she died within a few months. John Hart was driven from his wife's bedside as she was dying. Their 13 children fled for their lives. His fields and his grist mill were laid to waste. For more than a year, he lived in forests and caves, returning home to find his wife dead and his children vanished. You see, ladies and gentlemen, we, we see the glamour of, of modern day politicians and we see the fame and the glory that that they get for being our quote-unquote leaders. And yet what we don't see are those who've paid extraordinary sacrifices, extraordinary prices, extraordinary loss so that you and I might be free. From the Battle of Concord, to the Battle of Gettysburg, from the beaches of Normandy to the hill of Iwo Jima, men and women have paid the ultimate price 
so that you and I might be free. And can I take just a moment since we didn't do it earlier in, in this special service, and if there are any, any men and women who have, uh, have served our nation, would you stand and let us honor you real quick? Do we have anyone here this morning? We do have a few. Please stand. Please stand for me. Thank you. Can we thank them for their service? because of them. It's because of their sacrifice. It's because of the sacrifice of my now deceased grandfather who fought in World War II. It's because of them that you and I are free. But might I ask us, ladies and gentlemen, this morning, how determined are we today to be free? Here's what, here's what a recovering politician can tell you. It's easier to sit back and let someone else do the work. We don't want to get our hands dirty. We've been brainwashed to believe that you're not supposed to talk about politics and religion. And nobody wants to hear you talk about it. And I promised myself I wouldn't get personal this morning, but, but I'll just say this. If you really want to find out who your friends are, get involved in politics. You'll find out. Because nobody wants to get involved in that dirty process. And yet as a result, ladies and gentlemen, this past May... When it came time to vote in our primary, a very important part of our process, all across the state of Indiana, only 13% of eligible voters decided to take the time to vote. Forfeiting really what is the most important right that you and I enjoy as free people. And that is the right to democratically elect in our constitutional republic the men and women who will represent us. Only 13% went to the polls. Because, Don, it just doesn't matter. It's, it's not that big of a deal, and we can't do anything about it. And, and so... There's no reason to get involved, and you got to have a bunch of money, and they'll ruin your reputation, and yeah, they will, and they'll do everything they can to destroy you. It's just, it's really not worth it. Just leave it to them. And so a couple of weeks ago, while we all sat on our hands, an unelected federal judge overturned a law that had been in effect in the state of Indiana for 198 years. They said marriage was between one man and one woman. And suddenly we were up in arms saying, how could this happen? It happened because we really don't think about what it means to truly be free. Or what price we're all willing to pay to be free. If I was given a sermon at this moment, I would say, can I get an amen? But maybe some would be more prone to say, ouch, and oh me, instead of amen. But ladies and gentlemen, let me just remind you. There were men and women who were determined to be free. And might I add, we're willing to pay whatever price they had to pay in order to be free. And so the third thing I want to share with you this morning is this. Right on the heels of the, term, the, the determination of freedom is, is this thought. I, I, I want to talk to you about the destiny of freedom. What will become of freedom? Freedom. You know, the last chapter in our nation's history is yet to be written. And yet, every day, 
we're made more and more aware of the fact that, that freedom's under attack. And say what you will, our, our liberties are being taken from us. And the comment that I made five minutes ago about believing that marriage should be between one man and one woman, it's very possible that, that in the future we could possibly face either being shut down or face a lawsuit for just uttering those words. Or talking that way out in public to say, well, this is my opinion. You know, this is what I believe. Well, you know, you, you could, you know, Don, you're becoming a conspiracy, conspiracy theorist. No, I'm not. But I know what's happening in other countries where people have the courage to stand for right. They are facing consequences. And so I don't have an answer to the question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close by challenging you. But I, I want you to think this morning with me, ladies and gentlemen. What is the destiny of freedom? What will become of freedom in America? What will become of freedom in a, in a land where only 13% decide to vote? What will become of freedom in a land where we all hate politicians? Which is why I'm not one anymore. What will become of freedom in a, in, a, in a land where we don't have time and we don't have the resources and we're too busy and to get involved in those meetings or to go to a Tea Party event just gets me involved in a way I don't want to be involved in? What becomes of freedom if, if, we, all, if we all take that approach? Well, let me ask you some questions. First of all, do we believe our rights are sacred? I'm talking to a bunch of religious people today. So let me get spiritual on you for just a moment. Do you believe our rights are sacred rights? Do you believe that when the founders penned those words, that that's exactly what they meant? That we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. They didn't give us those rights any more than the government gives us those rights. You know what I love the most about our Second Amendment? It's not just that we are able to protect ourselves from, uh, from criminals. Thank God we have that right. But do you know what's at the heart of the Second Amendment? The heart of the Second Amendment is not just a right to protect yourself from harm, but to protect yourself from a federal government run amok. Read it. And so our rights don't come from them. They work for us, right? We don't work for them. But if you believe what our founders wrote, that Washington and Indianapolis doesn't grant us our rights, but that our rights are sacred rights given to us by the Almighty God. I hope you believe that. If you really do believe that, then I think you'll still be determined to fight for freedom. But secondly, I, I ask you, do you believe our rights to be special rights? I believe America is exceptional. I, I disagreed with First Lady uh, Michelle Obama uh, oh, back in 2008 when she said, that after her hubby won the nomination, she said, for the first time in my life, I'm proud to be an American. Madam First Lady, I, I'm sorry, I strongly disagree with you. Every day of my life, I'm proud to be an American. And look, I, I, I'll, I'll admit to you, I, I'm not proud of, of what we have become in so many ways, but I am proud of our Declaration of Independence. There's not another like it in the world. I am proud of our Bill of Rights. There's not another like it in the world. I am proud of our Constitution. There's not another Constitution like it. I am proud of the men and women who've paid the ultimate price so that I might be free. 
I am proud of those that, that get up every day and, and fight for freedom. I, I, I'm proud that I have the privilege to be here today in a free nation and stand before you and challenge you to fight for our freedoms. You can't do that everywhere. Those are the things, Madam, Madam First Lady, that challenge me and encourage me to be proud to be an American. And so every day I get up and go to work, I am proud to be a citizen of the greatest nation on the face of the earth. And so I do believe our rights are special. I believe America is exceptional. And if you believe that this morning, then I, I want to challenge you to do a few things. First of all, I want to challenge you to defend your freedom. Let me just say, ladies and gentlemen, it's time to get off the sideline. Well, wait a minute, Don. You, you, you say you're a recovering politician. I am, but I'm not going to the sideline. And I'll probably get more in more trouble now that I'm not a politician than when I was. Because you just never know what I'm likely to say. And I don't have to worry about a campaign consultant telling me not to say it. Look out Facebook. It might blow up. It almost did a few weeks ago when I ran my mouth about something. Why would you do that, Don? I do that because I care about freedom. Oh, but I don't want to offend anybody. Well, listen, we're past that. You know, freedom's under attack. Freedom's being assaulted. Uh, more and more people are headed to the sidelines. No, look, we're past uh, not being able to offend anybody. I apologize if you're offended this morning, but I'm going to say what I need to say to keep America free. So I'm asking you, I'm asking you to join me in that fight. I'm asking you that if you believe our rights are sacred and you believe our rights are special, then I'm asking you to defend those rights. I'm asking you to defend our freedom. And I'm asking you to declare our freedoms. I, you know, I, I don't, you call me crazy, call me sentimental, I, I don't know. But I, 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 like, I like getting together with family and friends and during the holidays. I like that. But, but the 4th of July is a special holiday, isn't it? And to me, it should be more than, than just uh, getting together and, and eating way too much and, and, um, and having a good time with family. You, you know what we did? We did something we, we've not done before. We went to uh, the symphony with, with uh, some family and friends. And uh, some are here this morning and, and um, heard the symphony on the prairie and, and uh, listened to uh, the reading of the Declaration of Independence. And, you know, it was patriotic did it cost you a penny or two? Yeah, it did. Popcorn was great, though. Thank God for good popcorn. That's true Americana right there, ladies and gentlemen. But don't you think every opportunity we get to be patriotic, we ought to take advantage of it? C call me sentimental, I don't care. I teared up today when the flag was coming down the aisle. I teared up watching you all stand and one by one you, you followed someone's lead and you put your hand over your heart. I, I, I tear up at God bless America. I tear up at God bless the USA sometimes even when I'm singing it. Hopefully y'all aren't tearing up for the wrong reason when I'm singing it. You know, I, I, I think it's time we, we quit sitting on the sidelines and we declare our freedoms. Don't you? And I don't mind talking politics. I don't. I don't mind telling somebody why I'm pro-life. I don't mind at all. D do you? I, I don't mind at all telling somebody why I strongly believe in the Second Amendment. I don't mind at all telling somebody why I, I think it's important that we honor a state statute and, and the freedom of, of, of religious liberty and why marriage should be between one man and one woman. I don't mind having those conversations. You see, ladies and gentlemen, if we're going to maintain our freedom, we're going to have to be willing to declare our freedom. And I pray that it never comes to this third one. But I would, I would hope if necessary, every one of us here today would be willing to die for our freedom. I don't even like to say it. But I would hope at the end of the day that if it meant paying the ultimate price, 
Whatever it takes to be free, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're willing to pay whatever price necessary to be free. And so I close with this. Freedom's destiny depends on one more important thing. And that's freedom's dream. Ronald Reagan, my favorite president, you, if you come to my office, you'd see several pieces of memorabilia dedicated to him. Someone thought maybe I was worshiping him. I'm not. Stick your head in the sand if you're that crazy. Never mind. But Reagan said it best when he said, Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Or one day, we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in the United States when men were free. You see, ladies and gentlemen, I, I've lived the American dream. I haven't grown up, didn't grow up in a, in a wealthy home. I grew up on a small farm on the southeast edge of Greensburg. My parents still live on that farm. My parents taught me the meaning of hard work. When it came time to, to go to college, I, I had worked to pay my way through college. And I was extremely grateful that my father worked for Wilhelm Construction in Indianapolis. And he got me a job. He got me the job. I'll, get, I'll, I'll, I'll give you that. But I had to keep it. And I worked extremely hard. And you know what I learned? That if you worked hard, you could accomplish really just about whatever you want to accomplish. Only in America do we live that kind of dream. And so now here I am some 40 <clears throat> some years later and I have a son getting ready to go to college and a 15 year old son and brand new twins. Don, some might ask, why, why would you bring babies into a world as messed up as ours is? I'll tell you why. Number one, I still believe in an almighty God who loves us and cares about us and who has not forgotten us. And I still believe in the American dream. And I still believe that by his grace and by his blessing that we can pass that dream on to our children. And we can pass that dream on to our grandchildren. And that the dream of freedom that has been instilled in us can be passed on from generation to generation. A couple of years ago, we were in Washington, D.C. and it was extremely cold. I think it was in January, January of 2011. And we went to... Um, Arlington National Cemetery. If you ever go to D.C. and you don't have a lot of time, let me challenge you that if you have to choose one place to visit, go to Arlington National Cemetery. And stand there and watch the changing of the guard as they guard the bodies of men whose names we don't even know. The inscription says, here lies a soldier known but to God. And while we were walking up to that sacred spot on what I believe is hallowed ground, a car pulled up beside us and a guy rolled down his window and he said, 
folks, and it was just our family. He said, there's getting ready to, to be a procession come by here. Uh, we're getting ready to lay a soldier to rest, and you're welcome to, to, to stand here, but we ask you not to take pictures, and, and we ask you, you know, to be respectful and reverent. And about that time in the distance, we heard the fife of a drum, and we heard the clopping of horse hooves, and then we saw a horse-drawn caisson carrying the remains of one of our fallen soldiers. And so our family reverently stood there with our, with our hands over our hearts as, as that procession passed and we were reminded of the incredible price that's paid that we be free. And when we finished watching the changing of the guard and we started to leave, I just couldn't help myself. I, I said, y'all, I think we need to pray. And so we just huddled in a circle and wrapped arms around each other and, and in extremely cold weather, we took just a moment to thank God for our freedom. And we took a moment to ask God to once again bless the United States of America. And I left there, ladies and gentlemen, reminded of the fact that as long as you and I keep the dream of freedom alive, the dream of freedom will never die. But it's up to me and you to pass the dream of freedom along. And in the closing moments of my little speech here, I, I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that if you're here this morning and you are in spiritual bondage, I want you to know there is one who paid the ultimate price so that you might be free. And the price that he paid 2,000 years ago when he shed his own blood for your freedom is still a good price today. And 2,000 years later, it still works to set people free. I challenge you this morning, fight for freedom. Don't sit on the sidelines and let our freedoms be taken away. We're free today. We want that freedom to be passed on to our children and our grandchildren. It's up to you and I to make sure that we're free. Thank you. God bless you.